Abdominal pain is a common complaint both in the outpatient setting and the emergency department with a broad differential diagnosis. The following true story illustrates how difficult it can be to arrive at a diagnosis in one of these cases. A 19-year-old previously healthy man presented to the emergency department with severe diffuse abdominal pain that had started abruptly one hour earlier, unrelated to food intake or another apparent cause. He noted no fever or diarrhea, but reported vomiting clear fluid. Sudden onset of abdominal pain could have several possible causes. One consideration is infectious gastroenteritis, resulting from pathogens such as norovirus, campylobacter or salmonella. However, without accompanying fever or diarrhea, such causes are less likely. The patient reported that before the pain started, he had been feeling well. He noted that he had a similar episode several months earlier, which had gradually resolved. He didn't seek medical attention at that time. Appendicitis, pancreatitis, peptic ulcer disease, nephrolithiasis, bowel obstruction, perforation and ischemia, or myocardial infarction can cause acute abdominal pain. Myocardial infarction and bowel ischemia are unlikely given this patient's age, though he should be asked about risk factors for ischemia, including anabolic steroid or cocaine use. Given that the pain was recurrent, chronic diseases such as inflammatory bowel disease, irritable bowel syndrome, vasculitis, IgA deficiency, parasitic infestation, celiac disease, pancreatic insufficiency, and eosinophilic gastroenteritis should also be considered. The patient reported normal bowel movements, with the exception of occasional constipation. He did not observe blood or mucus in his stools, and did not report foul-smelling stools. He also denied dysuria, palpitations, chest pain, or back pain. He had no history of surgery, and denied a history of alcohol excess or smoking. His family history included an uncle who had recurrent episodes of abdominal pain and who died at age 70 from an unknown cause. The normal stools make inflammatory bowel disease and malabsorption syndromes such as celiac disease or pancreatic insufficiency unlikely. A diagnosis of nephrolithiasis remains possible without urinary symptoms and a urinalysis should be performed to look for red blood cells. In the emergency department, the patient appeared uncomfortable, but was alert and oriented. He was tachycardic with a heart rate of 106, but otherwise had normal vital signs. His abdomen was soft and slightly distended, with mild tenderness to palpation in the mid-abdomen, without rebound tenderness or guarding. Carnet's sign and McBurney's sign were both negative. Carnet's sign tests for abdominal wall tenderness that increases when abdominal muscles are tensed and is indicative of abdominal wall pathologies such as erector sheath hematoma. The absence of carnet sign suggests a visceral cause for the pain. Conversely, McBurney sign looks for point tenderness on deep palpation one third of the distance from the right anterior superior iliac spine to the umbilicus and has been traditionally considered a sign of acute appendicitis. The negative carnets and McBurney signs make abdominal wall pathologies and acute appendicitis less likely. However, we should review laboratory testing before fully ruling out appendicitis. The complete blood count and basic metabolic panel were normal. Additionally, lipase, liver enzymes, thyrotropin, and CRP levels were normal, as was the erythrocyte sedimentation rate and urinalysis. In the presence of normal vital signs and an unrevealing physical examination and laboratory tests, emergencies such as an acute infection, appendicitis, obstruction of the gastrointestinal tract, nephrolithiasis or bowel perforation are very unlikely. The normal lipase and liver tests are inconsistent with pancreatic or biliary disease. The normal erythrocyte sedimentation rate and CRP make primary inflammatory disorders and autoimmune disease less likely. He was treated with intravenous fluids and an antiemetic agent. His symptoms completely resolved within three hours, and he was discharged from the emergency department. Over the next several years, the patient presented to the emergency department on numerous occasions with the same symptom complex, unrelated to food intake and never associated with fever. 
The patient noticed that after abdominal attacks, he was not able to have bowel movements for at least eight hours. His abdominal pain typically resolved within a few hours after supportive treatments. He did not report mood changes, itchy rashes, flushing, weakness, or sensory changes, and had no history of psychosis. The patient's transient inability to defecate after a pain episode points to temporary obstruction or dysmotility. At this point, rare diseases that can cause severe, diffuse, and recurrent abdominal pain should be considered, such as acute intermittent porphyria, a disorder of heme metabolism, familial Mediterranean fever, or FMF, a genetically inherited disease characterized by recurrent attacks of fever and serocytes, mastocytosis, a disorder of mast cell proliferation, and eosinophilic gastroenteritis, an inflammatory disorder characterized by eosinophilic infiltration of the intestinal wall. However, these diagnoses are inconsistent with our patient's clinical presentation. Patients with acute intermittent porphyria commonly have neurologic or psychiatric symptoms, such as sensory or motor changes, mood changes, and psychosis, Familial Mediterranean fever is unlikely in the absence of fevers, and mastocytosis is unlikely in the absence of flushing, pruritus, urticaria, and hypotension. During outpatient follow-up visits, multiple upper gastrointestinal endoscopies and colonoscopies were performed, with biopsies for histologic examination, all of which were normal. The patient's normal intestinal biopsies tell us a lot. The absence of villus atrophy is inconsistent with celiac disease, and the normal level of eosinophils is incompatible with eosinophilic gastroenteritis and certain parasitic infections. The lack of mast cells again argues against mastocytosis. Finally, there are no crypt abscesses to suggest inflammatory bowel disease and no granulomas as may be seen in Crohn's disease. The normal endoscopies and colonoscopies also make parasitic infections less likely. Additional laboratory results included normal quantitative immunoglobulin levels, negative testing for hepatitis viruses, and negative serologies consistent with autoimmune disease. A genetic screen for mutations associated with familial Mediterranean fever was negative. MRI scan of the pancreatobiliary system, abdominal ultrasonography, and magnetic resonance enterography were all normal. In an attempt to relieve the patient's symptoms, antispasmodic agents, anxiolytic agents, and tricyclic antidepressants were prescribed to treat possible irritable bowel syndrome, but the patient continued to have episodic abdominal pain. The test results rule out FMF, IgA deficiency, hepatitis, and autoimmune disorders. IBS is usually associated with diarrhea or constipation or both. This patient reported normal stools and did not respond to medications that are often used for IBS. During one of the patient's subsequent emergency department visits, abdominal CT showed marked circumferential wall thickening of a large segment of the proximal jejunum with hyperenhancement of the mucosa, mesenteric edema, and a moderate amount of intra-abdominal fluid. The intermittent wall thickening of the jejunum probably represents mucosal or submucosal edema. This finding, along with a history of recurrent abdominal pain in an uncle, is strongly suggestive of hereditary angioedema, a disease characterized by recurrent episodes of swelling in various parts of the body that can be severely debilitating. Abdominal pain can be the sole symptom in an attack of angioedema. Triggers include emotional stress, physical trauma, infections, physical exertion, surgery, and other medical procedures. At this point, the patient's abdominal attacks had been occurring intermittently for 10 years and were increasing in frequency now up to every two weeks. On further questioning, the patient also recalled a single episode of mild tongue swelling in the remote past. Testing revealed a low C4 complement level and a low C1 esterase inhibitor activity level. The lab results, coupled with a single episode of tongue swelling, are consistent with a diagnosis of hereditary angioedema. C1 esterase's main function is the inhibition of the complement system to prevent spontaneous activation. When C1 esterase inhibitor is low, as in this disease, the complement system can run amok, resulting in inflammation and swelling due to bradykinin activation. 
Treatments for acute attacks of hereditary angioedema include C1-esterase inhibitors, either plasma-derived or human recombinant, a calantide, a plasma calicrine inhibitor, and icatibund, a bradykinin B2 receptor antagonist. Prophylactic treatments in current use include plasma-derived C1-esterase inhibitors, calicrine inhibition, either with the oral agent lanadelumab or the small molecule berolchastat, antifibrinolytics, and attenuated androgens. Repeat C4 and C1 esterase inhibitor testing confirmed the diagnosis. Treatment with danazole, an attenuated androgen, was started, as other preferred treatments were cost prohibitive. Six months after beginning treatment with danazole, the patient reported no further episodes. Determining the cause of recurrent, episodic, severe abdominal pain can be challenging since the differential diagnosis is broad, as was the case for this patient. He underwent extensive evaluation over a number of years that ruled out infectious, inflammatory, and structural causes of pain. Ultimately, the finding of bowel wall thickening, in combination with a detailed history that uncovered an episode of tongue swelling and the family history of episodic abdominal pain, revealed the correct diagnosis.